Okay, tipo, hey, it's a school, the, a new, a brand new school that we created in Barcelona uh, in 2019. Uh, and we are a group of uh, enthusiastic teachers who decided to open a free school in the sense of a school that is not attached to any university and decided to create a workshop where uh, students and people interested in type design could join us and have this experience of working together um, by designing typefaces and also using these typefaces in editorial projects. So we were born as with this idea of um, create a custom type design for a specific design projects but also uh, giving students the possibility of developing their own skills in type design and lettering and editorial design, etc. Um, the course uh, is divided into, uh, into modules. That's module one and module two. Module one is mostly based in lettering. We call it the letra y palabra, and that's letter and word. And the idea is to be focused more on drawing letters and words for lettering. And then the second part is uh, focused on the project of a student and it's about type design and the use of the typefaces that they develop. Um, in the module number one, we develop uh, many things, but the most important thing of this module is that we are starting from zero from scratch and uh, training students in calligraphy. Calligraphy for type design. It's not calligraphy for the sense of calligraphy, it's calligraphy with the purpose of uh, understanding uh, how typefaces are built. And we created different exercises with different professionals. This is an exercise that we created for uh, teaching students to draw properly a course, so working with the seers. And then we also worked a lot in the idea of uh, creating br uh, brands based on concepts. Here you can see some examples of that. And later uh, also we entered a little bit in animation and art direction. These are very few examples. If you visit our website, you could uh, easily see all the projects and, and it's on, in more detail. And the model two, that is uh, letter and, and typefaces, is uh, the, 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 the core of the, pro of, the, of the course. The core of the, of the course is based on this idea of that we are going to design typefaces for a specific purpose. And today uh, we have here uh, three of our best students and Cecilia, Guillermo, and, and Claudia, they will present their own projects. Then later you will also be able to see on the website that you will see the link at the end. So I'm going to just ask Cecilia to enter to explain her project and see you later. Um, hi, my name is Cecilia. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's great for me and I'm sure that it's great for my, my classmates as well to have this space to share with you our type uh, design projects developed at Tipo G. So I would like you to show you a quick tour through the inspiration and then this and the design process of my typeface Valedora. So, Valedora is a display typeface inspired by street signs of Mexican black letter. Mexico's interpretation of the black letter with its robust, irreverent, and unpredictable shapes speaks of inherent qualities of Mexican culture, diversity, and contrast. The objective of this typography is to evoke that game of expression, strength, and contrast, linking the manual re reinterpretation of street signs with formal characteristics of rotunda gothic calligraphy and bringing it to a functional and contemporary type of typographic system. So um, here you can see a, a quick view to some of my references. As you can see, it is an infinite world with you can play with. Uh, some of these signs are more faithful to the real black letter style and others are uh, more free interpretations with uh, a bit of a, a naive touch. Uh, I love all, all of them, but I, I actually love more the, the craziest ones. Uh, so most, most of the, these references are took from a great book called Mexican Black Letter from Cristina Paoli that compiles and classifies Mexican black letter signs found in Mexico. So of course, uh, in order to synthesize and systematize all of this, it was necessary, first of all, um, 
to um, take just few references and mix them uh, with historical references from Gothic letters. So I investigated a little bit more and uh, um, I wanted to know more about the origin of these signs in Mexico and how did the black letter style got to Mexico. And I found that the first book printed in America was Doctrina Breve from Fray Juan de Sumarraga, and it was set in Rotunda Black Letter. So I decided to take inspiration from uh, Rotunda style to make important decisions of my design, like the X high, the proportions of, of the letters. So here you can see an example of a later uh, publication from the 5076. On the right, you can see a calligraphic model from my calligraphy mentor, Keith Adams, here in Barcelona. And then you can see, uh, finally, some selected signs that I use for, for my design. And below, you can see a bit of the synthesis of the process of one of the letters. Um, so here you can see the sketching process. I draw a lot. And I also did calligraphy brush, uh, calligraphy with a brush in order to understand better the shapes of the letter and also to understand the italic structure of, of, of this letter. So here you can see some formal features of the regular version and the italic version. I think the most difficult part was to managing to extract the essence of the Gothic letter and, and synthesizing it in something more contemporary, avoiding falling into excessively uh, ornate design. So here you can see the design space and the interpolation. So I have uh, six, max six masters from the regular and the italic version. I draw the thin and the, the regular and the bold version and the light is uh, an interpolation. So um, here you can see an specimen with all the, um, the weights of the typeface working together and a little bit of the look and feel of the typeface. And there is a great quote in this book from Christina Paoli that says, regardless if it's drawn on cloth and old metal plate or, or a piece of cardboard, black letter has the ability to make known that which cannot be easily verbalized, history and how history manifests in the present. So actually this was my objective. I wanted to design a contemporary typeface that could breathe this essence of history and tradition. Um, here you can see some examples of the, of the typeface. And I also created an stylistic set for the uppercase letters, as you can see here. And finally, uh, last but not least, my favorite quote from this book was uh, this one that sums up a bit what it was like to design this typeface. Mexican black letter can be analyzed on many levels from different points of view. It is as complex, playful, and irreverent as Mexicans. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Guillermo González, and I'm here to present you my first typeface, being important the word first and we'll come back to it later so the first the first part of the process was to define a briefing and as laura told you before we need to work uh, side by side between an um, editorial project and a typeface develop project and i decided to go with the constitution of spain because at that time in spain in spain we were having a very uh, controversial time here with what was constitutional what was not and i think about that and i i end up uh, thinking that nobody reads the constitution because it's very difficult to do so. And I told Jordi and Laura that maybe it could be a good idea to do my own version of the, of the constitution of Spain and a typeface for that specific task. And they told me that was okay, but maybe I could uh, open the site a little bit and do a typeface to make tough and difficult to read text more uh, appealing and easier to do. So. I decided to do with that to go with that, and my approach to the type design project was to do a text typeface with uh, for difficult and intimidating texts, in order to make them more appealing but still formal and serious. 
and I thought the first thing I thought was if it, they were need they were a need to be uh, easier to read, humanist typeface will do the work, but with a low contrast and a serif because we're talking about serious stuff. And then I thought that maybe a slab serif will be better because I would like to highlight words in order to structure texts at first sight. And I was facing very, a lot of problems with that because the slab series, slab serifs are very black and bulky. And I will, I want to have to need to enhance a lot of the inner space and cut blacks and insert more contrast in order to make the overall texture a little bit more gray instead of black. And at, at the very first moment I started sketching around and I was thinking about cutting black in the inner part of every letter that I could, um, getting rid of the counters of every um, serifs in the inner parts. And through that, try to make an overall more, as I told you, gray texture instead of very black and very bold. I uh, also reduce, um, reduce the um, contrast, uh, sorry, boost the contrast in some way. And I was thinking about, yeah, making this dialogue, the curve and straight form, the main thing of them and the main topic of the typography and a very uh, big character characteristic about that. But I was having some trouble as you can see here with some forms and as you can see here how they develop around the process and I one day I was talking to you already that I was having a lot of trouble thinking about how to translate all that into an italic and he told me that maybe I will need to do a more historical uh, point of view and taking a scotch rooted italic with a very generous angle to contrast a lot of with the Romans and also taking advantage of that typical um, in and outs of the italics and making that dialogue here as you can see in the upper part of the screen here the end uh, it has the that dialogue between curb and straight forms and here is some of the most important characteristics of my type and some sketches of the italic as well as I told you before, I was focusing a lot on the constitution and I do I did my editorial project side by side with the with the type develop process and I end up having a lot of book, mini booklets with the constitution, which also spreads into a bigger collection of posters with the most important things of that every booklet in order to make them more friendlier and more easy to read. And also you have here all my character sets to this time, to this moment, and I need to make it a little bit more big, the family, with the, an italic, bold italic, and maybe a thing which I'm working on right now. And last but not least, you can see here some specimen flexing kind of thing uh, for the different weights and how they interact with each other. And that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Claudia, thanks for having me, I'm really happy for being part of ATP. <laughs> um, I'm going to share a little bit of my project today, um, first like talking a bit about me, like I I'm Brazilian, so since the beginning of the project I really, I wanted to bring something that it was like related to my roots and especially like from my hometown, something that was related to my hometown, Sao Paulo. And um, so, yeah, um, I wanted to create like a, a typeface that was dedicated to the, to the counterculture scene of my hometown. So I wanted to be like provocative and more like a more uh, expressive and um, the editorial that I wanted to create was related to a rap album from an artist that I really love from Sao Paulo called the Misida. And uh, I think like expressiveness is the, 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 the word that expresses more like what I wanted to bring to this project. Um, so uh, my inspiration to create this this typeface was the Picho, that is a, a style from Sao Paulo, that is basically like a style that um, you can see in the buildings of the city. So like uh, the artists, like the Pichadores, as we call, 
uh, they go like higher in the buildings and put their marks on it and it's like kind of like the higher the better and it's like since it's kind of it is against the law like you need to do it really fast and uh, so there's lots of lots of the contents effects like lots of um, yeah, affects a lot of the, the drawings so um, for example the the gestures like since you need to do it fast sometimes like it gets like this unpredictability and it, it's like way more easy to do like the vertical bars than the horizontal so it's like you can see that it's like the drawings are really uh, vertical and uh, this affects a lot of the contrast as well uh, because of the tools so like i started like analyzing a lot of the characteristics of this this style to translate in my typeface but as you can see like this style is very very um especially like it has a really pro problem with the legibility so like my 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 issue here was kind of like uh, how could i translate these sort of characteristics to a font that i wanted to work on text so i started like doing the studies of like uh, understanding a bit of the construction so like this sort of construction construction that is like breaking in parts and it's not for example like this oh you can you don't do the oh like with two gestures you're breaking more more gestures and these are things uh, these uh, higher horizontal bars or lower horizontal bars that are not that not normal in fonts from te uh, with four texts um, so i like i tried to experiment how to translate a bit of these these um, characteristics in this this font like a font for a text and like we don't have in visual the lower cases so i started with the upper cases and then i wanted to translate like how how could like i started thinking how could this be translatable to the lower cases so it's like i really try to emphasize this vertical uh, this verticalness of the font and then like uh when i was starting drawing like um i noticed like these sort of details that was like being made by the nib so i i decided to incorporate in the font because I thought it was like interesting. It could bring like this imprevisibility of the gesture to the font. And so like I started like digitalizing from this and I kind of like the, the results a bit like, but this was like the first sketches. And for the italics, uh, like the thing with the italics is that the gesture it's continuous like you don't remove the pen from the paper like when you're doing a letter so how could i translate like a a font that it was like divided in pieces like mainly it was like one of the main things of like the, the, about this font how could i translate to the italics so it's like i started like studying ways of working with these with these sort of like uh, corners and you know, these sort of breaks that could work like uh, well between the the Romans and the italics. And uh, then like um, after I I was like pleased with the results of the, the regulars, I wanted like, because I wanted this to have like a, a good range of expression. So I decided to create like two extreme weights that it was like the black and the thing so i could like from these these weights i could interpolate and create two more weights the light and the the bold so at the end i had five weights thing light regular bold and black and this is like a bit of the result i'm really happy with the how it how it came came out um and yeah that's quebrada uh, just like uh explaining a bit the name of quebrada is uh also like to honor like the neighborhoods in brazil because we call quebrada like the poorest neighborhoods but it's like an affection like it's a you can call it with affection this sort of neighborhoods and it also means uh, broken or divided in pieces so it's like it kind of has like a double meaning that I think it really works for the 
the font. And yeah, and that's it. If you want to check a bit more about this project and other stuff that I'm doing, you can follow me or send me an email. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks a lot, Cecilia, Guillermo, and Claudia for sharing your projects. Uh, you know, we love them. <laughs> we are always super happy about uh, seeing them again, and you, of course. And we are going to say goodbye, but first we want to share with you these links. So the first is uh, the address of our school, if you want to see the program. Uh, I have to say that the website is still in Spanish, but uh, I think easily you can figure out things. So anyway, you can always send us an email and we can give you information in English, even though the course is uh, meant to be in Spanish for now. But uh, who knows, the future is, uh, is in front of us. And the second link is about the, the devoted website that we have for the projects of this year, where you can see in depth the projects of Cecilia, Guillermo and Claudia and the others, uh, the other students from the class. So thank you a lot. And yeah, so we are going to say goodbye now, all of us. And thanks a lot for attending. And thank we you. Are, <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you very much. And we are looking forward for the QA. So please make questions. We will be very happy about answering. And thanks a lot. See you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm hoping to have uh, 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 both uh, uh, Laura and uh, Claudia and everybody who's been involved here to maybe uh, get some questions. Hello again. <laughs> um, Hello, Laura. What a nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Yes, it's amazing work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are very proud of our students. <laughs> How not? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if there's anybody who has a question. Uh, I don't know if you want to go. I see now in the chat that you have also a QA chat. I don't know if people are asking, it's the first time I'm here in a session. So I don't know if people want to make questions in the chat or they want to make questions in the Q&A. Guillermo is connecting now. Um, yeah, and it was starting again, yeah. Hola, Guillermo. Hi. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you, Carolina. Hello. Hi. Oh, nice work to see. Um, what should we, how should we do this, Carolina? Should we wait for someone asking something? Yes, yeah, there is a question in Spanish, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's okay. Uh, Desarrollan las well, I can read the question and I can translate for you. Uh, Desarrollan las tipografías al mismo tiempo que el proyecto editorial, o primero la tipografía y luego la editorial. Eh, ¿Nos puedes escuchar, Adriana? Eh, supongo que sí. Si estás haciendo la pregunta, supongo que sí. Eh, sí, vale, gracias, Adriana. Pues sí, o sea, la idea es, bueno, fue un poco experimental en el sentido de que era la primera vez que tirábamos adelante esa idea, ¿no? De hacer un proyecto editorial al mismo tiempo que el proyecto de diseño de tipos. El objetivo era tener desde el principio este concepto de que la tipografía estaba diseñada a medida para algo. Entonces, qué mejor que tener un proyecto editorial para tener, la, digamos, el camino a seguir de cara a diseñar la tipografía, ¿no? Pero arrancamos con el proyecto de tipografías, por supuesto, y después arrancamos el proyecto editorial a partir del tercer mes. O sea, arrancamos el del tercer mes, no, un poco menos, porque arrancamos el proyecto de tipografía en enero y el proyecto editorial lo arrancamos alrededor de marzo, más o menos porque necesitaba desarrollar algo para poder acceder a ello. No sé si respondió tu pregunta, supongo que sí. Carolina, la pregunta fue si estábamos haciendo el proyecto de design at the same time as the editorial project. 
So this, this was the concept from the beginning. The students had to design a typeface for something. And then the idea was to design a editorial project based on, on another briefing, but the two briefings were together. So that's the idea. But we started first designing typefaces and later we started designing the editorial piece because it was impossible to do both at the same time because they had no content, they have no idea. And also they were also changing the, the typefaces a little bit, the briefings of the typefaces a little bit. No more questions? You can make a question, Carolina. <laughs> what? <laughs> but I have a question, uh, actually, because I would like to know, and I actually asked this, I think I asked it to the calligraphers in Barcelona, and uh, I was actually curious if there was a, 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 ses, a special uh, trend or special, uh, uh, what you can you say, um, influencers on the typographic uh, scene in Barcelona that you feel could sort of uh, make a sphere that you feel that this is the style of Barcelona, this is what we want to work with, or do you feel that it's different? I think Cecilia should answer this question because she has been a student of uh, the calligraphy course and she has been a student of, uh, of the Master of Vena, the first master we have in Thai design, and later the student of the calligraphy course and also a student of Tipo Gel. So she has been in everywhere. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I think it's the perfect person to answer that. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Well, but you mean, uh, well, I think that, for example, for me, um, I've been, yes, a calligraphy student uh, at Visions, the same school where, where I was in Tipo G. And I, I was in the, also in, in, in when Ivan and Oriol were talking and I, I think you asked if they were like, a, if there was like a Barcelona style. But I, I think what has been really important for me is to have this calligraphic background in order to create a, or to understand how to create a typeface. For me it has been really, really important to understand and to study calligraphy with with uh, with Oriol, with Ivan, with Keith Adams, because they have taught me to to understand how calligraphy works in order to create a, a specific design or a specific shape for a typeface. So I also study lettering with Laura and and Ivan, and. We also, we always go to the roots and to the historical references, and we are always, always going back to drawing, going back to historical references, as I said. So, yeah, if you ask if there's like a Barcelona style, I would say the same that Ivan and Oriol told, that mm -hmm. it's, they have this way of teaching, very special way of teaching, of teaching where you can actually understand from scratch how this world works in order to create a, a typeface. I don't know if I if I if I yeah I, I think yes because I think that there's always like people who are influencers on the scene that sort of make a path that people get inspired by in different ways and it doesn't have to be like a, another um, typographic colleagues or another uh, calligrapher or your the, the sign paintings in your city it could be something something else I'm just wondering because I think that for me coming in Sweden we have a graphic designer who take a lot of space in 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 our uh, world of typography and 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 calligraphy and and type design is very separate so i think that influences in the way you can think about it and i and i get the feeling that it, there is a sort of a sort of a, a culture in barcelona that makes this happen and that actually what you see uh, respects the history and mm -hmm. also uh, let the history influence today's and the contemporary type designs, which I think is very interesting because it doesn't have to always be like that in all in all of the uh, different cities. But I think it uh, could be, but I would 
I wanted to hear what you said about that. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. No, thank you. I think we can't hear you, Laura. Do you hear Laura? Yeah, I was. Um, I guess you yeah. me. No, I think it's so funny, Carolina, that you can, of course, you're in Sweden and <laughs> we're a bit far. So it's Swedish style and Spanish style may be different from the beginning, not, uh, you know, because we are different, have different cultures. But I never thought about the possibility of having a Barcelona style in type design, actually, because it's only for uh, 15 years, 16 years that we have uh, type design teaching mm -hmm. in Barcelona that through this. Uh, Masters of Aina, where uh, I was a teacher as well in the past, or well, in the past, recently past, recent past. And there, was, he, uh, Keith Adams and Uriol Miro were the teachers of calligraphy. And Ivan, Mir Ivan Castro was the student the first year, you know, but the, Ivan was already a student of, of, uh, of Keith Adams. So the origin of the calligraphic scene is Keith Adams, without doubt. I mean, in Barcelona, that's clear. And he is not from here, but he lived here for 30, for 30 years or 40 years. I cannot even know. Mm -hmm. But uh, he has been teaching calligraphy to all the students of graphic design in two specific schools in Barcelona. So everybody knows him. And everybody had this feeling of uh, um, how calligraphy is. And then uh, Uriol Miró and Ivan are his, uh, his student, were his students. So later, Ivan and being the student, he became a teacher. And, and then when I came back from Taipa Media, I became a teacher in Aina. So Taipa Media is at Aina there. And later is also there through Noe Blanco. So it's a funny mix between, you know, what he was there already and what, what we brought from the Netherlands. Because also, as you know very well, the Netherlands, we were learning also through calligraphy. So I think calligraphy is so important. It's very, very important. And now Uriol, is, uh, Uriol and Ivan, they were teachers of Tipo G at the beginning, you know, in the, in the lettering part. So, uh, so we are a small team. It's not that we are the only ones. There are many more people in Barcelona, of course. But uh, and now we have more people that went to Taipo Media and came back and we, they are going to start teaching as well in Tipo G. Ricardo Garcia and Bolívar Mascareñas, they are becoming teachers of Tipo G as well. So there's more and more type of media <laughs> getting through that. Uh, but I think that the style in Barcelona um, in type design, um, I don't see it so clear as you can see it in, mm. from type of media. You know? I, can, I think that has much more influences because yeah. we've been self-taught for many, many years and different teachers have different ways of teaching because they have different ways of learning. But maybe in 10 years we can see if there's a yeah. clear difference. I think it's a bit, a bit early still, you know, because yeah. 15 years is nothing, you know. Yeah. So I would like to think that we are creating a tradition. This will be super nice to think about that. But also Cecilia, for instance, is already a teacher. Mm -hmm. So and this is always happening like this, you know, you are a student and then you become a teacher. And, and it's always something that is there, you know. But Cecilia also comes from Mexico and probably is different than coming from, from Brazil. No? Or, or, you know, I mean, we have such a strong, the Latin culture has such a strong background in terms yeah. of type and culture. And Cecilia put her culture there and Claudia put her culture there. And even Guillermo put her, his culture there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, from and Madrid. Culture, yes, from Madrid, you know. And this is what I really like from type, you know, that everybody has something to, to give and to, to say, you know from your own experience as a person, not as a designer, you know? And, and this is what amazed me about child designers too, you know? Yeah. yeah, and one thing that I would like to add there is that, for example, in the first part of the, of the course, we were very much more expressive in our work, and it was very noticeable if, that we were from many different backgrounds, from Brazil, 
eh, Madrid, Barcelona, and that was one of the most interesting things, interesting things to yeah to learn from other styles and cultures and backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. it shows me. I think I have this is our culture in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> that is Carl Erik Forsberg. He was a calligrapher. So we yeah. have actually. I think it's very interesting, but I'm also very impressed that you that this school uh, this school has started, and I think that a lot of people like there is nothing like this in Gothenburg. So I would be so happy if there was you know people coming back from type of me <laughs> to Gothenburg. That would be very nice because then we have a community, and if you have a community, you can start a school and you can start an educational program. So yeah. Yes. That's true. Yeah. This is what we managed to build, but not was done in purpose. It just happened in a very organic way. You know, you yeah. also need people who wants to teach, what is very important, <laughs> you yeah. know. So maybe all these people you have, they don't have an interest in teaching, you know, but uh, we have the feeling that we have to give back uh, what yeah. we got. So uh, it's also important. I mean, I think teaching yeah. has a role in society, you know, and I think we, this is what we are trying to do, you know, to trespass the knowledge to other people. And yeah, that's interesting. But I'm sure you have people in Sweden, Carolina. Yes, I, we, do. <laughs> we do. We have a lot of people, but we want to also get inspired to do changes and also get a, a stronger community. So hmm. how would somebody apply to your school? Did you put the link on that in the in Slack yeah, channel? The link in the chat. Um, but we can always come to Sweden, Carolina, as soon as COVID allows us to take a plane and the skies are open for us again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Excellent. Will, I think it's also interesting. I mean, it's my experience. I have been in Denmark, you know, as you know, several times. And and it's so great to to t be teaching in not in, in Scandinavian countries. <laughs> you know. There's much to teach in Scandinavian countries because yeah, I think we need this uh, little bit. Yes, but you a lot of crap. You know, will come and this is a, an, will be an inspiration. I think this is very important to have uh, presentations like this that actually so so you can start a movement that you can actually start a community because otherwise it will go away. So it's mm -hmm. sort of like a very fragile uh, situation. And also when we are online like this and everybody's locked up <laughs> somewhere, all type designers are locked up. But so <laughs> we, it's, I think it's so super important that we actually care and take care of our social network and our community. So yes. Yeah, at least we are keeping doing it. Yes. Santiago is saying that he's looking forward to stay by Estherholm. Yeah. Yes. Me too. <laughs> me, me too. But the first is um, Paris. Yes, and then we will know also what happens to uh, Tipo G. Do you say Tipo G or Tipo G? No. Yeah. Tipo G, like a super tipo strong. Ah, <laughs> so then uh, you will have an update for us and. Uh, all the things that you have learned and everything by starting it, uh, starting an education. Yeah, sure. And this year, we you if you visit the website, you see there's a bit a bit different because we couldn't start, we couldn't launch the second promotion in October because we didn't have enough students. So now we did something new, a bit well, not new but uh, a bit different. So we are starting in January, and we are including variable forms in the program, and because we have this new and uh, more sketching. We are including a lot of sketching because this is something that students last year uh, told us they were missing more sketching. So this year we are doing a sketching. And this is something what is quite interesting because we are a free school in the sense that we are not attached to an university. So we can reprogram every year anything yeah, we want. <laughs> yeah, so we want to change, change. people want to change, yeah. We're trying to be organic, you know, a little bit. You know? So yeah, this year, there's a question here. La siguenta generación de Tipuja. I'm not. I try to speak Spanish, but no. Uh, Adriana is asking if the next generation, meaning the next promotion, I guess, of Tipuja will be online because of the pandemic situation. 
So we want to do it not online. <laughs> So this is our aim. So we are starting in, in January. Hopefully we will be able to do it uh, in real, present. But we are going to offer some contents online, of course. All the um, history, 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 <clears throat> sorry, history classes will be online because the teacher is located in Madrid. Um, but he wants to come anyway. <laughs> so he, you know, Arriba Gorda, he's amazing. And he wants to come to Barcelona because he cannot not see the students, you know. Even though the yeah. students will be online for his classes, he wants to come at least. Um, and, and we will see because we are just uh, living one week away. I mean, we cannot plan anything. It's not in our hands. So we'll see yeah. how is the situation in January. But uh, what we, the experience we had last year, is that uh, we were lucky to start the course uh, presential, I mean, in the class, and we only went to lockdown after uh, two months that we started the project. Yeah. So this was key, very important, because at least we could start sketching with the students. But later mm -hmm. online was it was difficult yeah. for for many reasons, you know. We were quite a yeah. And, and we were lucky that the lockdown came later. I don't know how it could be if the lockdown started when we were starting with the briefing. I had no idea, probably very difficult. Yeah. But uh, in summer courses, what I've learned from people living in Barcelona, it's not so popular. <laughs> Everybody wants to go to the beach, so. Uh, this is, a, this is a, to a topic, of course. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's true that, uh, I mean, the city has a lot to offer and concentration is harder than if it was happening in the mountains. Actually, with type of media, for instance, if it had happened in Amsterdam, it could be, it could be something completely different than being in The Hague, you know. And I know this for sure. Actually, I only went to Amsterdam three times in one year, you know. And then you you are in The Hague and, and you are there, that's it, you know. And in Barcelona has this, attractive uh, thing that you are also living in Barcelona, but I think it's completely compatible because we are not uh, giving lessons every day. It's only three three afternoons a, day, a week. So it's, it's, it's compatible, you know, and it's also compatible with people who are working, that this is actually the most uh, normal profile of the students of our schools of masters in Barcelona, because we don't have masters uh, full-time masters. We don't have them. I mean, I don't know, probably, maybe in Rome, maybe medicine or somewhere, but in graphic design, there's no masters that are full-time in Spain. They mm -hmm. are not occupying 40 hours a week. Yeah. I wish, I wish, I wish we could do that. I will be super happy, you know, like I, having a studio and then you know being there all day eight hours people go people enter go out this could be super nice but uh, we are quite happy anyway how it went because they became friends and this is the most important thing about the presential classes that they create community among the students and this is extremely yeah. important i think this is online it's so complicated it's so difficult that uh, after being in the screens for six months, they become friends. I don't know, eventually, but being together in the class for sure, for sure, I think. Yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's very inspirational. <laughs> yes, it's very nice. Thank you so much for this presentation, and I hope that you will open up uh, the conversation. Maybe in Slack, there may be people coming in that are interested in knowing how to apply, uh, if they need some background or anything. All those mm -hmm. questions, you please contact uh, Laura and Claudia and Guillermo. And yeah, for sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.